and testimony. When we went to our, our leader's retreat, deacon's retreat, we had a chance to sit and bring Ken with us, and he shared so many testimonies of what God had done in his life and his wife's life. What a blessing that was to hear those stories and to constantly be reminded that who's really in control of all things. Well, some of you are wondering, what's going on in the youth and children's ministry? Well, you can find out by going to the church website or going to Facebook, and you can see pictures of, of what the kids are doing, what they look like. Well, perhaps the before and afters of what they look like would probably be more exact. This morning, I'd like you to get out your bolted inserts. There's some notes for you to fill out there. You'll need a pen. If you don't have a pen... I'll supply one for you. We thank the Lord for the, for the things that he's doing in our lives because we are through the Bible type of people. We are taking time going through the entire Old Testament and we're going through the New Testament. In Sunday school class, that's what we're spending our time doing. We're going through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the law. Do you know the law? I don't mean California law, I mean the Bible's law. Well, that's what we're going through. Spending a short, brief amount of time to give you the big picture. Relying on you to spend time reading it, but coming prepared to discuss it. And as we move from book to book, we want to highlight the important parts of it. And we've been going through the book of Romans, this being our last time in the book of Romans, before we move on to another book in the New Testament. It is great for us as believers in Christ to know the full counsel of God, to know everything that God has to say for us so that we might walk worthy of his calling. This morning, our sermon title is Sacrifice Made Easy. Sounds like an oxymoron. Because when we hear the word sacrifice, our mind sees. The word carries a tone of finality. To give up. To do something that we highly value is a concept that frightens our consumer mindset. It's noble in other people, such as the soldier who jumps on a grenade to save his comrades, or the man who is on a sinking ship and takes off his life preserver to give to a young child to save his life. We all hope in similar situations that we would act just as noble. Join me as we go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to your word, we ask for your guidance and direction that we would be the type of people that would do what's right, that we would look upon sacrifice not as something that is a negative, but as a positive. So we ask that you would remove thoughts that would distract our attention from your word this morning, from an opportunity to fellowship with you, and help us to pay complete attention to your word and how you would use it in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In the religious realm, the word sacrifice means to provide an offering to propitiate a deity or to pay homage to a deity. It's typically done through the slaughter of animals and humans. During a medical missionary trip to Africa, a woman came to receive medical attention for her ninth child. And when she was asked about the health of her other children, her, she responded that her gods had demanded that she sacrifice her eight children. That was not done a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. That was done in our own century, this century. Israel was rebuked for making their sons and daughters pass through the fire of Molech, offering up their children, their offspring, in sacrifice. The Christians Paul was writing to were familiar with this word sacrifice. Astrology and superstition had been replaced, had replaced the old style of worship in Rome. But sacrifice was still a typical thing that was used in their worship. And yet, when we come to Rome, it was spiritually bankrupt. It had nothing to offer the Christian. 
And Paul writes to the believers there, asking them to give the most precious thing of all, themselves. And as we come to our final sermon in the series of, right, of the righteousness of God, I want to remind us of the theme of this book. So turn back to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed against the sinfulness of, ma of mankind. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The first three chapters show that God's righteousness is the standard in which man must hold to, must reach. And before a holy and righteous God, man stands condemned. But God did not leave man in this position. In chapters 4 and 5, we see that man can be justified, declared righteous, and treated as righteous before a holy and righteous God when he believes that Christ died on the cross for him. And having become justified, God doesn't just leave him there. He wants him to be holy, set apart, sanctified. So the next verses, six, or next chapters 6 and 7, deal with the believer being sanctified so we see God's righteousness in holiness and sanctification but God doesn't just leave you and I there he looks in the future and sees what we are going to be because he has already determined that plan to take place and we see the righteousness of God in glorification what you will be in the future what you look like right now that's not the end I wish we could look out the window and see ourselves what it will be like in glory. Perhaps we would make a mad dash towards the door to try to arrive there early. Glorification. What would it be like? And the question might come up with God, that sounds so wonderful, that's so unique, that's so, so special. But what about the nation of Israel? Perhaps God is unrighteous because He has forgotten about His promises to Israel. And here, we see the vindication of God's righteousness in chapters 9 through 11. God has not forgotten the nation of Israel. God has a plan for them. And one day, they will all be saved. God is not through working with them. When God is done with the Gentiles, you and I, we will be caught up and gathered together with Him in the air to be with Him forever. And then He turns His attention back to the people of promise and starts dealing with them again. So having said all these great things in the first 11 chapters of the book, this is all doctrine. This is all teaching that the Apostle Paul talks about. Telling the, telling the Christian what Christianity is all about. He then turns to chapters 12 through 16. These next four chapters are dealing with exhortation. God's righteousness is is in exhortation in which he tries to encourage the believer now that I told you what to do let me encourage you to do that let me show you how to do that Paul points out three characteristics that are found in this life in the life of every believer who is maturing in Christ first a maturing Christian lives a life of commitment Second, a Christian lives a life of humility. And third, the Christian lives a life of love. These three characteristics are found in every maturing believer. Turn back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You have your outline? As we look at our very first characteristic, a life of commitment, your fill-in. The Christian life is a daily commitment to Jesus Christ. It starts with a decision in the mind and is followed through with action of the body. It is a life of commitment in regards to preparation and practice. In regards to preparation, notice the method found in chapter 12, verse 1. 
says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or rational, ser rational service. The method. The method that Paul uses, he says, I beseech you, I urge you. What would the method be if we were under the law? I command you. We are free from the law because Christ is the end of the law. In Christ, the law is complete. Our attitude towards each other is one of beseeching, urging, encouraging. Cal urged everybody to participate in the fall roundout. No one said, now I want you to do it and you will do it. It is this will be a fun, exciting event for all of us to participate. I urge you to sign up today. Don't miss out on the blessing of being part of this. What's the basis of this method? What is the basis of preparation? The first word that Paul, ha Paul has, therefore. Therefore points back to all Paul has said before. And perhaps the one word that could summarize chapters 1 through 11 would be mercies. Therefore, because of the condemnation, because of the justification, because of the sanctification, because of the glorification, because of the vindication, because of all this that we see, it's the mercies of God. Because of all this great wonderful things, God's mercy is directed towards the sinner. This is the incentive for spiritual maturity and a reminder of all that God has done for us. What has God done? A couple examples. Remember, God demonstrated his love towards us while we were still sinners. 5.8 Remember, Christ said, all things work together to those who love him. 8.28. How about 8.1? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. All of his mercy is pointed back to you and I. He demonstrates that to us. But let us look at the presentation. Back in verse 1, he says, that you present your bodies. Paul uses the same word here in verse 12, or excuse me, in verse 1 of 12, that he did back in chapter 6 where he says, I want you to present your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Here, instead of asking for individual instruments, instead of God saying, I want your hands, I want your eyes, I want your head, I want your legs. Now Paul is saying, no, present your whole body. Because the body is the instrument of the soul and the spirit. It is through the body that God is glorified. When he speaks of the body, he's speaking of the whole being. The immaterial and the material. But what way are we to present ourselves? How are we to do this? Next phrase. As a living sacrifice. Not as something that we would rather not do, but just the opposite. A sacrifice to God is to be given in eagerness, in joy, in presenting it to Him. It is like the child who comes running home with a picture that he has created. He's so excited, he runs up to his mommy or to his daddy and says, I made this for you! The beauty of that is not in the quality. The beauty is in the presentation. And as your thoughts go back to your children who have given to you that first picture that they drew or craft that they made, remember their glowing face, how proud they were, how excited they were because they had a desire to please. I did it for you. Paul is saying here to the believer, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, saying, Lord, I'm giving you all of this for you. With a smile on our face, sacrifice made easy. 
not difficult. Lord, I'm bringing all of these things that I did today, I worked today, and I'm bringing it to you. I'm excited to give this to you. Israel was accustomed to giving sacrifices. But in the land of Israel, sacrifices were done with animals. And the animal was brought onto the altar, and the altar was there, and the person, male or female, had to put their hand on the head of the animal in identification, and then the priest would cut the throat of the animal and it bled out. That sacrifice never got up. It laid there. The problem with this type of sacrifice that the Apostle Paul is asking us, he's asking us to willfully lay our bodies up on the altar. He says, but it's alive. And our problem is often we get up and want to walk away somewhere else. That's the difficulty of a living sacrifice. There's always the opportunity to say, but I want to go do what I want to do. The living sacrifice says, Lord, what is your will? I wish to seek your will. That's what I want to do. It is like the sacrifice that Abraham made with Isaac. I call that to your mind because that was a living sacrifice. Isaac was not a little child when Abraham brought him up to the mountain. He was a full-grown teenager. So you can imagine in your mind when he asked his father, What's the sacrifice that we're going to bring? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. In the back of his mind, he's saying, you're the sacrifice. And so the father is walking up the hill, grieved with this difficulty. He binds his son and lays him on the altar. Isaac knows what's taking place. He trusts his dad. He has faith in his dad. He has faith in his dad's God. You think, okay, well, you're just binding me. That's all right. But the knife is raised and ready to act. And God calls out, Abraham, do not touch the boy. Now I know that you will withhold nothing from me. God exercised Abraham's faith. A living sacrifice is marked by three qualities that are found in this verse. First, it's holy. We are sinners, but we come in Christ's blood, and the sacrifice is considered holy. It's set apart. It's unique. Second, it is acceptable God will accept it because it pleased him to see you in his will. Third, it is reasonable, meaning it is, a lot, it, is, it is the logical response of us when we recognize that we were, brought, we were bought with a price and we belong to him. The living sacrifice is, the, is what we should do. It is the response that one says after receiving someone. When you ask for something, someone responds by saying, can, can you pass the milk? And the person says, after receiving it, says, thank you. That's the reasonable response. For the living sacrifice, the, li the response should be presenting itself wholly in will with God's will and the logical service that lines up in following him. So brethren, let us commit our bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable, acceptable to God, which is only logical response that we have. And we say something like this, Lord, this is our body. We're giving this to you today. Thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. All that I am, you have given to me. May I use it today to bring you honor and glory. This morning we have sung sacrifices of praise that reflect your character and your name that you might be magnified that's dealing with the preparation how does it look in practice in regards to practice look in verse 2 do not be conformed we must stop being conformed the world system acts as a mold shaping people to the image of one another there are external pressures shaping one value system. It 
You say, well, I want my own value system. The world changes our value system. The world is passing away. It's temporal. So don't let the economy, elections, or the environment shape you. Only what's done for Christ will last. So stop following the schemes of the world. We are not like cake mixes poured into a mold. We are to be transformed. Follow along. And then in the rest of the verse. But be transformed. Metamorphosis comes from this Greek word. Our change comes from the inside, not from the outside. I love this word. And I'm sure your mind races to that ugly little creature, the caterpillar, who is metamorphosed into something else. The caterpillar spends his entire life, I don't say walking, but squishing together, eating and eating and eating and devouring leaves, and then finally wraps himself up into a cocoon, and then a metamorphosis takes place. And when that cocoon opens up, he is no longer this land-based creature, this ugly little leaf eater. He has beautiful wings, and he flies, and he sucks nectar out of flowers. He's completely changed from the inside. You and I are called to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because our position in Christ, we are now able to reprogram our thinking. We can control what enters our mind. What comes in there, we have the choice of saying, that goes out, or that is allowed to stay in. We can feed the mind good things about God that focus our attention upon God. Turn with me to Ephesians, or Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. So we can see how the renewing of the mind works. Paul's writing to them, he said, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true... Is that objective or subjective? Objective meaning, is that just a, a flat-out truth based on God, or is it subjective? Is it how we feel? Is it open to interpretation? It's objective. What if, whatever things are true, the idea, don't give time to hypothesis and speculation. Focus on what's true, objectively true. Whatever things are noble, dignified, worthy of respect, whatever things are just, right, whatever is God's standard, whatever things are pure, wholesome, not contaminated by other things, whatever things are lovely, things that promote peace, Whatever things are of a good report, that's positive and constructive. Meditate on these things. Roll them over in your mind. You'll be able to examine and approve what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. As we think about these things, as we focus on the things that are of God, we will have less time thinking about the things of the world. Our mind will be renewed because there will be no place for the things of the world. You and I can examine, oh, and test to the approval of what is good. Is that acceptable? That's not acceptable. That's not part of the mature, complete will of God. You say, wait a minute, that's just hard to do. That's hard work. Yep. Sure is. It's a life of commitment, but it's also a life of humility. Your second point. Humility is one of those traits that we all need, but we have no idea how to accomplish. It seems like we're trying to catch water with a net. Paul speaks of humility in regards to a mindset. In verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, soundly, 
as God deals to each one a measure of faith. In regards to a mindset, he uses this word think three times. The first thing he mentions is don't have the wrong image of yourself. Be what you are. Don't try to be what you're not. Don't be dissatisfied with what God has given to you. God has given you gifts, abilities, spiritual enablements. Don't be dissatisfied with what God has given to you and look at somebody else and say, I want to be able to do what someone else has. It is difficult to walk through the facility and not see some of the beautiful artwork that's around here. I wish I could do that. God says, do not wish you could do something else. Do what I've given you to do. That's the wrong mindset. The mindset and the wrong self-image. I've given you a specific job to be a part of this body. Have the correct self-image. Paul says, all that I, have been, that I have received, it is by grace, not by merit. God has given out to each person. He has divided a measure of faith. God is not going to let you fail. What God has given to you is not just so you can take and stumble along. Well, I can't figure it out, and I'm afraid if I use it, I'm going to fail. God's purpose of giving it to you and I is so that we can succeed and turn around and say, Lord, I did this for you. And he could turn and smile and say, that's what I'm talking about. Well done. I am pleased. I'm offering my whole body to you in holiness. That's what I want. There's a life of humility, and it starts in our mind, but it's also seen in the membership, how it interacts. The members in verses 4 through 8, memberships, members make up the entire body. But notice the thing about members. They belong to one another. They're not independent. They belong to the greater body. Members have different functions. But each member has a graced ministry that differs. And that grace is to be given to one another. Paul lists all these different ministries. He talks about prophecy. The idea of giving God's word. That was important during that time because when Paul wrote this, the scriptures were not complete yet. So prophecy was important in the early church. Somebody had to communicate God's word. Ministry, service, the attitude of serving one another, teaching, taking the, what they did have and sharing it with one another. Teaching is not just lecturing. It is the idea of coming along someone and showing them how. Exhortation, encouragement. I think sometimes we think that's not really that important. But encouragement is every, can be everything. Because sometimes we just need a little pat on the back or a little attaboy to move us to that next level. I appreciate this church so much. And your walk before the Lord is a great encouragement, not just to myself, but to others who come and visit. I'll close the sermon with just such an exhortation to all of you that will be an encouragement. To lead leadership. Someone has to be in charge. Someone has to say, here's what we're going to do. And everyone has to say, yes, we, we acknowledge that, and we'll follow that. Mercy. The gift of mercy. Showing mercy to one another, to fellow mankind. You realize that hospitals were started by Christians? You realize that care for prisoners were started by Christians? You realize that these are, are all expressions of our third point. A life of love. It is interesting as we go through these points that the first point deals with a life towards God. The second point is a life towards man or inward. The third point, a life of love, is outward. The life of love is seen in, in respect to the church and in respect to the community. In respect to the church, verses 9 through 13, we see, I want to start with verse 13. It says, distributing to the needs of the saints. 
given to hospitality. Love is manifested by caring for saints, by caring for the body. And this body does that. When there's a need in the, in the body of Christ, everybody steps up and turns. What can we do to help one another? How can we assist? How can we serve? Love is illustrated in verse 10. Be kindly affectionated, affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, seeking the best for one another. No, you go first. If there's a meal, it's always letting someone else go first. It's putting others first instead of ourselves. And this church does that. This church lives a, a life of love. And I commend you for that. And I exhort you to do it even more than you're doing it now. In respect to the community, there is no lacking in love directed towards the community from First, Great, from First Baptist Church. Love manifests itself in its, in its reaction. Notice in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Verse 16, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your minds on things higher, but associate with the humble. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Verse 21 pretty much sums it up. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus wept with those who wept by the tomb of Lazarus. He cried with those who needed tears. He associated with those who were humble. He overcame evil with good. We likewise do the same thing. Shed tears with those who are in need because of compassion. We associate not with the highest and the, those of the largest political clout or the most popular. We associate with those who are of the humble, the ones of, who are loved by God. And we overcome evil with good. Even if in the back of our mind we're saying, yeah, but I'd like to give them one of these. Instead, we give them one of these. Do we do this? Yes, we do. But you say, that's just the pastor's thing that he'd say anything to his congregation. Now, that's not true. But I read you an email in closing that we received from a, a person who visited us visited us on September 2nd. Hello from Louisiana. I've been trying to get around to sending this email since I flew in. I just wanted to follow up on my visit. I was there on September 2nd. By the way, I've edited this a little bit for length. Coming from the South, you always hear people talk about how not to expect that warm Southern hospitality we're used to here. And to top it off, my friends all teased me saying find, finding Christian friends wouldn't be easy either. Well, all I can say is God's hand is on your church. Well, I met these two inviting smiles outside. It was nice not to walk in late by myself in an area I was not familiar with. They were so friendly and genuine in welcoming me and showing me where to go, I truly believe God gives some people this gift just to be that selfless. I had to remind myself I wasn't in Louisiana because everybody there was so nice. She even let me sit by them. I forgot my Bible, and she allowed me to read along. I have a thing about little things, so to me, that was a big deal. It gets better. She introduced me to others who I could tell loved the Lord just as much as, as they did. It was real, not fake. I like, blend, I like blended where you have hymns and pianos, etc. So I loved that we sang the hymns that I grew up singing. The pianist was great too. Someday I'm going to learn to play. And the message is about being in Christ. And I liked how you used the object objects to connect. 
I bet there were even kids that would take that message home. I thought that was neat. My heart is in the ER. She's a nurse. But I was a teacher for six years. So I thought, can you imagine the kids going home and talking about the sermon that they not only heard but saw with their family and even friends at school when they could be talking about anything else? It looks like God is doing some amazing things there, and he definitely shines through the hearts of your church family. I just wanted to thank you all for welcoming me, and I'm glad I stumbled across you all online and can say everyone here in Louisiana is wrong because wherever I went, people there are so nice. I look forward to go, going back and visiting when I move. So thanks again. Walnut Creek First Baptist Church, all of you, praying God's continue to use y'all and bless y'all, your sister in Christ, Sam from Louisiana. You live a life of commitment. You live a life of humility. And you live a life of love. And it's seen from those who come and visit you are living the exhortation of Romans 12. But I encourage you to do it more. I encourage all of us to do it more as we are becoming people of the Bible. As we spend our time focusing on the Word of God. May that continue to transform us. So as we interact with each person, we ask ourselves, am I living sacrifice today? Is it all about Him today? I trust we could all say, yes, Lord, it's all about you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of the visitor who came just a few weeks ago. What an encouragement it is to, for all of us to hear that we are loving people. We're not loving, and we don't want to pat ourselves on the back. We're loving because you love us so much. And that is a natural result. Our attitude that's found here is because of your attitude towards us. And it just seems to naturally pour out. Lord, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to fellowship with one another here. To fellowship in your Son. And as we leave going about our, our, our busy lives, going out to eat, with one another, with our family members. May we keep Romans 12, 1 and 2 as a center core of what, how we're acting and what we're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.